Okay. Let's suppose we looked at something like this. values. This one here is about 14.8. This one here is about 15.8. Okay, so that chlorine dropped the pKa by about one unit, okay? which is pretty good. Pretty not bad drop for just one chlorine. Let's look at another example. Suppose we compared ethanol to T butyl alcohol and see which one is the stronger acid. Okay. So again, how do we figure it out? We look at the conjugate bases. So let's draw them over here. Okay. 
Okay. So there are the conjugate bases. Again, what we need to do is find out which one is weaker and which one is stronger. Okay. Well, this time I don't see any halogens for electron withdrawing groups, do I? Okay. So I have to look for something else. Okay. Here, what we need to learn is that methyl groups are electron donating groups. Remember we learned that for carbocation stability. So here I have three electron donating groups. So they are going to push electrons toward the oxygen. So what is that doing to this conjugate base? Making it less stable. Making it less stable. Okay. So this here is a stronger base than the ethoxy ion is. And so what does it make this acid over here? A weaker acid. Okay. So just to give you some values, pKa of ethanol is 16, of t-butanol it goes up to 18, two units. So you can see the power of those methyl groups of their electron donating ability. Okay, any questions on those? Okay. So be able to predict if an alcohol is stronger than another alcohol, okay? Any questions on this? Okay, well, we see that alcohols are not very acidic, so I'm gonna have to use a decent base to take off the <coughs> hydrogens, okay? So let's look at some ways that we can deprotonate alcohols. see when it does this reaction, you never get the methoxy ion by itself. It always comes with a metal counter ion. So if you were to name this, how did you name that one? Sodium hydroxide. Well, do the same thing here. Sodium methoxide. 
Look at a third way to take off the alcohol hydrogen. And that's using NaH, which stands for sodium hydride. So let's suppose we had cyclopentanol. Don't show it on one, don't <coughs> show it on the other. But if you show it on one, you have to show it on the other. What would be the name of that one? Sodium cyclopentoxide. Okay, good. So we get sodium cyclopentoxide. So these are three different ways to take a hydrogen off any alcohol to get these alkoxy ions. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay. We'll be coming back to these reactions later on. Okay. So keep these on note cards and keep them systematized. I have a question, sir. Question. I noticed that you are uh, like staying around group one. So is this something that we see with cesium, rubidium? Yeah. So you could also do the reaction with rubidium, cesium, francium. The only problem is these get so reactive that if you did it, it would be very explosive. So that's why we stick with these two. Okay. Good question. Why do we buy the well? Same reason? Yeah, lithium's not as reactive, so we got to kind of go in between those two there. 
So, just by you know way of story here, uh, when I was in graduate school, I had a flask of some sodium in there. Okay, and I thought that I had gotten rid of all the sodium, so I started washing it out with some water. Well, water does the same reaction as alcohol does. Okay. And you can predict that reaction. Sodium plus water gives what? Sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. Okay. So what's the big deal about that? What's the hydrogen gas comes off. So I started seeing hydrogen gas coming off. And all of a sudden I saw a little spark <laughs> from some heat. Then the next thing I saw was it exploded in my hand. It sent me to the floor. <laughs> and then it sent me to the hospital. <laughs> so I got a scar to prove it. See it on my thumb? It cut me open. Anybody else have any scars? That's right. So you never forget something if you get scarred, do you? Yeah. Right, you can have an external scar or an internal scar. Which scar hurts more? Internal. Oh no, this doesn't hurt anymore. Oh, this doesn't hurt anymore. Oh, this doesn't But internal can last for years. Okay. So anyway, it's an explosive thing, so you got to be very careful when you're cleaning these out. Okay. Very careful. a little bit. The book kind of shifts gears at this point when we look at number five. We look at grignards. So have you ever heard of grignards? Okay, well, let's see if we can figure out what they are. 
So Grignards are a kind of molecule that are called organometallics. What do you think an organometallic is? What does that sound like? Metal. You see the word metal in there? And you also see what? Organic. Organic. Okay? So an organometallic is a compound where you have some metal attached to a carbon. Okay? There turns out to be lots of different types of organometallics. Okay? You can have the metal be a lithium, for example, and have a organolithium compound. Or you can have the metal be a magnesium, and we get what's called a Grignard reagent. Okay? So that's all Grignards are, is magnesium attached to a carbon atom in a molecule. Okay? So, for example, Here's an example of a Grignard, where you have magnesium on a carbon, and it usually has a halogen of some type, like bromine is the most common one. How would you be able to make that Grignard? What you do is you start with the alkyl halide. In this case, it's a bromine. Okay. These also work with iodine and chlorine, but again, bromine is the most popular. And you simply take that and react with magnesium and these are generally done in an ether solvent of some type. And what happens in the reaction, what happens in the reaction is the magnesium inserts itself between the bromine and the carbon sometimes called an insertion reaction. And so we get this here. Okay. Another example. You had a bromine on a cyclopentane. react with magnesium, and again, ether solvent, the magnesium would insert itself in between, and you would get that greener reagent. These are examples of Grignards. Okay. <clears throat> you might say, what's the big deal about making Grignards? Have a popular name with them. What's the big deal about them? Well, let's find out the big deal. Okay. If you look on the periodic table, you see magnesium and you see carbon. Which of the two is more electronegative? Carbon. Carbon. Okay. You rarely see that. Okay. So the carbon is more electronegative. So we get a dipole moment like that. 
Okay. So the carbon builds up a negative, the magnesium builds up a positive. But remember from general chemistry, metals love to be positive. They love to lose electrons. So this thing would love to do this. just to split apart so magnesium gets its full positive and that would leave the carbon with a lone pair. See that? Same thing down here. So what's the fundamental property of Grignard's, okay? Fundamental property is these things are very basic and they can act as good nucleophiles, okay? So this is the rule you want to do when you see a Grignard. Write it down, pull off the MGBR and write a lone pair on that carbon atom. Pull off the MGBR and put a lone pair on that carbon atom. So this is where we can start doing some chemistry. Okay. So let's take a look at some basic chemistry with Grignard's. Thank you. 
draw that product. reaction is very similar to the one we did in the triple bond chemistry. If you remember that, when we attack the triple bond with a lone pair with a carbonyl. Okay, so let's do this one step by step. So we know what's going on. So again, I can erase the MGBR. getting the negative charge from these high electrons coming out. And then the oxygen grabs a hydrogen in the second step. similar. We did the exact same thing in the alkyne chemistry. Remember that? Where we had this attack. And we got the same thing except the triple bond added on there. Okay, so go back in your notes and that should ring a bell there. All right, well, let's go ahead and stop it here for today, okay? And we'll look to see you on Friday.